So it's my real pleasure to introduce Professor Mandalam Seshadri today, who's going to speak to us on COVID lessons learned in India. And uh, Dr. M.S. Seshadri studied medicine at Christian Medical College, Valor in Tamil Nadu, India, before completing a PhD in endocrinology at Sydney University in Australia. He was professor of medicine and endocrinology at CMC and also professor of endocrinology at Kuwait University. And he's currently now the honorary medical director of the Rumalai Mission Hospital in India. He is a member of several research committees, societies and panels, and has over 120 publications in national and international medical journals. He was also awarded the Sat Paul Mittal National Award in 2018 for Outstanding Service to Humanity and a Lifetime Achievement Award from Sri Venka Taswara Institute of Medical Sciences as well. So it's our pleasure today, Professor, to have you speaking to us on the subject, and we look forward to learning from you uh, and the lessons learned in India about meeting the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, Peter. I'm very pleased to be here today evening to talk to a number of professional colleagues across the world uh, during the COVID pandemic time on a topic which is of interest, I'm sure, to everyone. Uh, lessons learned in India from its handling of COVID-19. Response to pandemic in individual countries depend upon the inherent strengths and weaknesses in their respective health systems. As you all know, India is the second most populous country in the world for nearly 1,400 million people. Okay, the inherent weaknesses in India is very high population density in metros, apart from its huge population, insufficient number of healthcare workers. There is a big urban rural divide in healthcare facilities, with most facilities in urban areas and few facilities in rural areas. There's a large rural population, nearly 65%. So the rural areas tend to be quite underserved in terms of their healthcare needs. There is lack of a national level public health department, which should have been designated to handle a pandemic of this nature. We felt the lack of it acutely during the pandemic. There is a deficiency in health promotion and preventive health education because of this lack of a national level public health department. There's a high prevalence of comorbidity. As you all know, India is nearly the diabetes capital of the world. But India has its strengths. It has the demographic advantage. It has a relatively young population, a high level of mobile phone penetration right into the rural areas, good ease of communication across the country. India is called the pharmacy of the world because its pharmaceutical industry manufactures a large number of essential drugs for the entire world. India also has a high vaccine manufacture capability and vaccines made in India are exported to needy countries in the world. How well did we in India handle the pandemic? This is the epidemic curve of India showing the daily new cases from world of meter corona. You see two waves. The first wave is spread out over a long period of time. It has a rather broad peak. And then there is a lull, a period of endemicity where the number of infections were less than 20,000 per day, followed by the second wave, which is far more aggressive, which progressed very rapidly, reached a peak, and descended also very quickly, again to reach a plateau phase or an endemic phase. This is the epidemic curve of India. Two peaks, 
and two endemic phases. Now, if you look at the mortality figures in India, it closely follows the same pattern that you saw in the daily cases. But the peak occurred about two weeks after the new case peak. This is because of the time interval between infection and death. The two peaks are actually symmetric. The first wave was spread out over 10 months from March to December 2020. And the first plateau where the cases were less than 20,000 per day, which we call the endemic phase, lasted for 10 weeks from January 2021 to March 2021. The second wave was spread out over a much shorter period of time, just six weeks less than half the duration of the first wave, March 13, 2021 to July 14, 2021. And after July 14, the number of daily cases has been consistently less than 40,000, a second plateau, which represents the second endemic phase, which has now lasted about nine weeks. Epidemic curve in India reflects actually the natural course of the epidemic. It's a symmetric bell-shaped curve both the waves. But the first wave was modified by a nationwide lockdown. Vaccination in India was rolled out on 16th of January 2021. But the pace of vaccination was relatively slow initially, but it has picked up now. The first wave was mostly due to the D614G variant of the Wuhan virus, which had a basic reproduction number of 1.52. It spread very slowly. The cumulative reported infections were 10.29 million. The cumulative reported deaths were 150,000. But the actual numbers infected and the actual deaths were probably several fold higher. Now, if you look at the zero prevalence studies done by the Indian Council of Medical Research. In May to June 2020, barely three months after the onset of the epidemic in India, only 0.73% were positive for antibodies, which actually works out to 10.2 million infections. In the second zero survey, the figure rose to 6.6% positive, 92.4 million infections. The third zero survey, conducted December 20 to January 21, 21.5% were positive, antibody positive, representing 301 million infections. But you also can easily understand that by the end of the first wave, the zero prevalence figures were 30-fold higher than the reported number of cases. Even zero prevalence actually underestimate true infections because antibody levels decrease over time and nearly 30% of those infected are negative for antibodies after six months. How well we, did we handle the first wave in India? We handled by an abrupt nationwide lockdown. There were benefits. Certainly we prevented rapid spread, as you can see, the epidemic was spread out over a long period of time and the number of cases, cumulative number of cases were curtailed. This allowed time for healthcare facilities in India to gear up. But this abrupt nationwide lockdown also produced harm in terms of loss of livelihoods. A large number of migrant laborers in urban areas were actually left in the lurch. They had no income and no way to return home, and so they suffered. Of course, this nationwide lockdown resulted in an economic downturn, which was quite a problem. However, the lockdown was not complete. It was leaky because the migrant laborers actually did return to rural areas even though it was difficult for them to do so, they did that. But this resulted in rural spread occurring even during the first wave in India. 
The second wave in India was due to the Delta variant, which had a basic reproduction number of six to eight, which means it spread four times faster. The cumulative reported infections at the end of second wave were 19.65 million, exclusively due to second wave, and it was approximately two times the number in the first wave. Cumulative reported deaths, likewise, were two times that in the first wave. But the actual infections and deaths were many more higher. Why was it so? Because there was a public reluctance to undergo tests, and there was incomplete death reporting. This is just not unique to India. I think it occurred in many countries in the world. How did India handle the second wave? India was very jubilant that the first wave was over and thought the epidemic was over. So India was caught unprepared. There were huge gatherings without COVID appropriate behavior, like the Kumbh Mela. There were several states that went through state elections. The health facilities in many states, even though they had been spruced up, were inadequate to handle the huge number of cases. Emergency and intensive care facilities were overwhelmed. There was a lack of oxygen and vital drugs, particularly in metros. And this led to a state of panic. However, our healthcare workers fought very valiantly. Governmental and non-governmental agencies worked very well together and facilitated essential medical supplies. The Delta variant, however, ran its course, even as it's running its course in several other countries in the world. There were some states, such as Kerala, which handled the first wave very well. And because they handled the first way very well, they had a larger number of vulnerable population. And these states which handled the first wave very well were the worst hit by the Delta variant. And they are continuing to have higher numbers of infections even as of today. Now, how well did India perform in terms of vaccination? This is the proportion of the population which actually got vaccinated. And on the x-axis, you find the dates. By July 14, when the endemic plateau was reached, only 5.6% of the population was fully vaccinated. So after the second wave, when we had entered the plateau phase, only 5.6% of the population was fully vaccinated. Therefore, we can say the vaccination made only a minimal contribution towards the regression of the epidemic to endemic phase. It did play a part, but not a big part. I mentioned earlier that one of India's sense has been its information technology. How well did we use our IT tools in pandemic management? There are some very good examples. We had a COVID platform for vaccination so that every individual who got vaccinated was identified, registered, first dose and second dose were clearly mentioned with the date, and vaccination certificates were issued to individuals, and the whole process happened quite well. There was some minor hiccup, but then overall, this platform did extremely well. We had something called Arogya Setu app, again, done by the government for providing information to people. And this provided very useful information to individuals regarding the status of the epidemic in their locality. India, as a whole, received voice messages before every phone call, reminding people about social vaccine, consisting of mask use, hand hygiene, cough and sneeze etiquette, and avoiding crowds. There's a COVID India org platform that was developed for updating the information. 
so we did many good things with our it capabilities but the question remains whether we could have used our it tools better now when it came to the second wave i said we were caught unprepared scientific handling of the second wave was needed one needed to closely study the dynamics of the epidemic we needed to have real time information at each district level we needed to have meticulous planning some flexibility and optimal time and materials management what exactly do i mean by epidemic dynamics when you see the epidemic curve you see three visible peaks daily new cases daily deaths and daily active cases however these numbers rapidly increase then start decreasing and the point at which this decrease in numbers happens needs to be clearly identified and this is what we call additional conceal peaks you have a momentum peak for new cases momentum peak for mortality and momentum peak for active cases i will explain this a little later india epidemic curve the country's epidemic curve is a statistical average of its individual states and in each state the epidemic curve is a statistical average of its districts the onset progression peak and decline of the waves was grossly asynchronous across different states and across different districts for efficient pandemic management we needed to have district wise epidemic dynamics readily available on a daily basis this concept was proposed by us and an it professional mr muru subramani worked with us he used our concept and data and made an online website with district wise data curve which was updated daily the link is provided as a last slide now this is what i meant if you look at the second wave of the epidemic in india you find that the numbers steeply increased up to a certain point and then there is a shoulder or a little decrease in the rate of it okay and then there is a numerical peak and then the epidemic curve starts coming down now can we identify precisely the point at which this deceleration occurs we can we can do that if we plot the change in cases every day against time as we have done in this graph then you find that the momentum of the epidemic peaked much earlier than the numerical peak and then the momentum started declining and it went below zero that means the number of cases actually started the change in the number of cases actually was negative if one day the case was 250 next day was 170 right so that kind of change occurred okay so this is how you interpret this particular graph which you call the momentum of new cases the peak of this momentum occurred on 21st of april 2021 for the second wave what is the value of identifying this momentum peak after this there is a slowing down of viral transmission it indicates that the numerical peak will occur soon say within the next couple of weeks the most important thing is that lockdown is actually most effective when the momentum is rapidly increased and the lockdown can be eased when the momentum starts decreasing so this gives you an indication of when to start relaxing curbs on pub, you know uh, on the on the public this curve shows similarly the change in number of deaths change in daily disease cases over time 
you again find there is a peak and then it comes down to zero and then it becomes negative the point at which when it touches zero actually represents the numerical mortality peak after that every day the numbers progressively come down to less than zero that means if the 250 deaths the previous day next day there are 170 deaths okay the value of identifying the mortality momentum peak was that after this peak, because the mortality starts decreasing, the district can anticipate a decreased need for emergency and intensive care services. Also, a decrease in need for oxygen and essential drugs. And districts and states which have crossed this peak can prepare to share their surplus supplies with needy neighbors who are in a different phase of the epidemic. Now, I will explain the concept of asynchrony. You look at this slide. This is India's uh, epidemic peaks. The blue line represents the momentum peak of new cases. The red line represents the numerical peak of the new cases and the green line represents the active case number of active cases uh, at any particular point in time so we identified the different peaks of india's second wave epidemic curve the numerical peak the new cases momentum peak was the first one to appear on 21st of april Roughly three weeks later, we had the numerical peak. The mortality momentum peak was the next to appear after a gap of about three weeks. And the numerical mortality peak occurred about three weeks later. The active cases actually peaked around the same time as the numerical mortality peak. Only five days difference between the two. Now, that was India's epidemic curve. I said India's epidemic curve is a statistical average of the epidemic curves of its individual states. This is the state in which I live, this is Tamil Nadu. These are the epidemic curves of Tamil Nadu. You find that Tamil Nadu's peak occurred later than India's peak. The same peaks occurred, but they occurred later than that of the uh, overall Indian epidemic curve. Now this slide compares what happened in India with what happened in Tamil Nadu. If you look at the momentum peak, India's momentum peak was 21st of April, Tamil Nadu's peak was 12th of May, roughly three weeks later. The numerical peak correspondingly occurred 17 days later in Tamil Nadu. The mortality momentum peak occurred nearly four weeks after the national momentum peak. The numerical mortality peak was similarly delayed by nearly two weeks. The active pieces actually peaked about 18 days after the peak in India. Okay, So this is what I meant by asynchrony. So the national epidemic curve, which is a composite of its individual states, is very different from what happens at individual state level. Now, districts. Now, this is Chennai district in Tamil Nadu. These are the epidemic curves of Chennai. You find the blue line representing the new case momentum peak first. The red line showing the numerical peak occurred a couple of weeks later and the active cases peaked a further two weeks later. So what happened in Chennai? Now in another district in Tamil Nadu, during the same time frame, the same peak occurred considerably later. This is Coimbatore district in Tamil Nadu. You find all the peaks occurred later in Coimbatore. So even within individual states, the epidemic curves were asynchronous. 
even within tamil nadu chennai's epidemic peaks occurred earlier and those of kambatur occurred later and this is the same state of affairs across every district in every state so we made an online website available free to all district level health administrators and officials to help in evidence based management of the epidemic they were able to anticipate what was going to happen and all this was made possible by use of information technology now there was one problem that occurred in india i think this happened in several other countries in the world the preoccupation with the pandemic led to inadequate management of non communicable disease patients and they constitute a large number non communicable disease patients were unable to access their service providers could we have made online consultations widely available quite early in the epidemic yes we could have if we had thought about it the lack of a mechanism for caring for non communicable diseases like diabetes led to a mini epidemic of a fatal fungal infection mucormycosis in diabetics this occurred particularly in the metro in mumbai pune chennai many patients with non communicable diseases such as cardiovascular and chronic lung disease actually died at home without medical attendance seriously ill patients stayed at home because of fear of covid they were afraid to go to hospital so the increased mortality to to non communicable diseases added to the covid mortality now i said i work in a secondary level hospital how exactly did we go about managing covid where we work i present a few observations from our own hospital and community program our non governmental organization consists of thirumalai charity trust and thirumalai mission hospital it covers a population of 60000 in about 350 villages around the hospital our trust area is actually non communicable diseases they very common in the area and underserved right at the onset of the pandemic we made plans we made online consultations available to non communicable disease patients we had mobile vans with the nurse visiting our villages to enable online consultations patients with diabetes and hypertension had their blood sugars and blood pressure measured at home by family care volunteers and multi purpose health workers who are part of our organization we have something like 450 family care volunteers and about 20 multi purpose workers they were all busy doing this taking care of non communicable disease patients at their home so they didn't have to come out and expose themselves to the virus but care was delivered at home the results of all these measurements were communicated to doctors in hospital and appropriate action was taken if anybody became sick we provided transport to hospital and in our hospital we streamlined covid patients and non covid patients non covid patients were managed uh, in uh, separately okay covid patients were managed separately so streamlining was very important we also evolved the home care package for families with mild to moderate covid because whole families got infected during the second wave we provided a pulse oximeter thermometer electronic bp apparatus glucometer we loaned this from our organization and families were taught how to use these devices our nurses contact these families over phone twice a day and found out what things were how things were going and they could at any time contact a phone number where somebody would answer and tell them what to do in case of an emergency we deployed home oxygen concentrators for care of those with mild hypoxia somebody who has got a oxygen saturation of 92 or 93 could be cared for at home with home oxygen so we bought home oxygen concentrators which were again loaned 
to families. Transport was provided for those who needed faster transmission. We used information technology for promoting social vaccine concept in our districts. And we also used IT to overcome vaccine hesitancy in our district. What do I mean by social vaccine? Social vaccine is what we had available for bulk of the epidemic in India. You recall that the biological vaccine became available only on 16th of January and the two at a rather slow pace. So we had to depend upon social vaccine for epidemic control. This was vital. So this consists of information, authentic and adequate information educating the public and effective communication and all these things are aimed at promoting change in behavior like wearing a mask like washing hands like cough and sneeze education okay all these were conveyed we made short video clips in regional language circulated to families through whatsapp messaging and we provided information on practical steps for cocooning the elderly. This is a very important concept. Reverse quarantine of the elderly and vulnerable so that they are not exposed to the virus, so don't get infected. Remember, these are people who have high mortality if they get infected. Universal mask use was, protect, was promoted. We taught them cough and sneeze etiquette, hand hygiene, and avoiding crowds. We also provided intensive IEC program for small groups of individuals through our network of family care volunteers and multipurpose workers who emphasized this concept. And in use of the face mask improved from a baseline of 24% to 75% with just education and providing information. And our villagers were very clever. They devised their own methods for protecting the elderly. Okay, often in a family, the house may have only two rooms, but they devised their own individual methods for protecting the elderly and vulnerable. They made also plans to quarantine returning migrant laborers from nearby metros. They had made plans individually at the village level. I will present some information on our outcomes with all these reports. Now, we have categorized patients as elderly if they are more than 55 years because India longevity is lower than in other countries. Elderly with comorbidity, people with age less than 55 and comorbidity, age less than 55 and healthy. We categorize the population, these substrata. And the total numbers are mentioned in the first column. And look at the numbers who were visited by our healthcare workers. 97%. 97% of all the people were visited and they were educated on how to use the social vaccine concept. Now, if you look at the patients who actually develop respiratory symptoms, that was only 5.4% during the second wave. And certainly it was higher, 18.2% in elderly more than 55 years, 11.7% in elderly with comorbidity, 6% in those under 55 with comorbidity, and only 2.9% in healthy adults age less than these numbers indicate the program of education and communication. The last of patients who had symptoms suggestive of only one fourth of patients who had any respiratory symptoms. Now this slide shows how many people had RT-PCR tested in the different categories, how many had a positive RT-PCR, how many were admitted and how many died, and how many were managed by home isolation. You find that the test positivity rate 
was very high 27.5 with those more than 55 48 percent there are one out of two tests were positive in elderly with comorbidity 48 percent in those less than 55 with comorbidity 42 percent those under 55 were healthy so the infection rate was very high judged by the rt pcr positivity rate but the bottom line is important only 22.2 percent of those patients who had any respiratory symptom actually had rt pcr this is because of reluctance on the part of families to go for testing they were scared and this is something we constantly tried to overcome but we really could not overcome that adequately but if you look at the mortality you find overall there was a 15 percent mortality the entire group but the mortality was certainly much higher in those who were elderly those who were elderly with comorbidity and those who were younger with comorbidity they had mortality rates that were two times that of healthy individuals less than 55. now look at the last column which is home isolation this is where we played a role providing care at home home isolation occurred in a substantial number of patients who had symptoms but who did were not uh, rt-pcr tested and negative so even in the presence of a negative rt-pcr test we asked them to isolate themselves at home if they had symptoms suggestive of covid and this certainly helped in preventing further spread now we compared two villages Ponai and amur which are under our program with two other villages Verkada and Vela which did not have access to our health education program. These were areas that were not covered by us. Now, I, I want you to focus on the uh, following thing. The population, total population in the two areas was very similar, 7,932, 7,783. Number of households, not very different. Those above age 55, 748 in the two villages covered by us, 765 in two villages not covered by us. Symptoms occurred only in 42 out of 748 in the villages covered by us, whereas it was twice that number, more than twice that number, in the villages where our healthcare education did not penetrate. And similarly, COVID symptoms were considerably higher in the two villages which did not get this kind of education in small groups. Now, the test positive rate, admission, deaths are compared to the slide. You find only five patients needed admission in the villages where our education program was effective, whereas in the villages where education did not penetrate, 20 patients required admission and one died. We had no mortality in the villages which were educated. So we can conclude that our program of intensive and effective uh, education and communication worked in reducing the impact of the second wave in the area which we covered through our hospital and our trust. Now, what about vaccination coverage? How well did we do in our small hospital with its surrounding population? Now, COVID vaccination cover up to 25th of August 2021 is projected here in the age group of 18 to 44. Remember, in India, age group of 18 to 44, vaccination was commenced later. Earlier, the priority groups were people who were older and those who had comorbidities. Now, these are youngsters who don't have comorbidities. In that group, our vaccination cover, vaccinated with at least one dose was 45%. Vaccinated second dose, 31%. All right. Now, the national average for vaccination 
as of that day, 21st August, one dose vaccination was only in 33%. And no, two dose vaccination was covered only in 9.7%. So our effort at promoting vaccination through information, education, communication, bore fruit in that we were able to achieve roughly three times the national average of vaccination in our population. Now, this is a question that every country now has. Where do we go from here? We are at a particular point in the face of the epidemic. Where do we go from here? This question is the answer to this question I am suggesting only for India because of its current endemic state. Now, the fourth zero survey done June, July 2021 showed that 67.6% of the population is positive for antibodies. That accounts for 946.4 million infections. Now, the zero survey identified nearly 33 times the number of reported infections. Okay. There were no urban rural difference in infection rate. That means infection had spread across rural areas as much as it had the urban area. More than 50% of children aged more than six who were surveyed, who were included in the survey, had antibodies. So children had also been exposed to a fairly considerable extent to the virus. 85% of health workers had antibodies. These are the results of the National Zero Prevalence Survey, the fourth survey which ended in July 2021. I already mentioned, in fact, we pointed it out quite early when we were writing about this, zero surveys underestimate a proportion of the population that is infected. According to an ICMR study, 30% of RT-PCR positive patients, proven infected patients, become antibody negative six months later. Therefore, the actual proportion of population exposed, if you correct for this factor, will be almost 85 to 90 percent. What actually do these numbers mean? These numbers really mean that COVID has become endemic in India, that the majority of the population has been exposed to the virus and has been sensitized to the virus and probably immune. In an endemic state, a low rate of daily infections will continue indefinitely. Why? Because people can get reinfected. And these reinfections will actually outnumber new infections in our country. The susceptible pool of individuals from now onwards will consist of daily addition to the population by way of new births. There are nearly 70,000 new births per day in India. So these, these children who are born are, have not been exposed to the virus, so they are naive. In addition, the 10 to 15 percent of the population who are still unexposed as per the zero survey are also susceptible for the infection. And those who have a poor immune response, where immunity is actually waned and antibody titers have come down to undetectable levels, are also susceptible. So these three groups will constitute the susceptible pool, susceptible for infection with SARS-CoV-2. But this pool is too small to cause a big third wave. Therefore, in our opinion, a third wave is improbable in the near future, unless a variant of the virus with a basic reproduction number or R0 of more than six to eight, more the basic reproduction number more, more than that of the Delta virus actually emerges. If that happens, you may have a small wave, but in the absence of that, I think we'll continue to be in a persistent endemic state. What are the practical implications? Our vaccination strategy has to have a course correction. We have to focus on the 10 to 15 percent of people who are as yet unvaccinated or elderly and vulnerable. 
we need to focus on them, trace them and make sure that they get vaccinated because they are at risk for serious disease and death. Now, we need to commence vaccination of children, but this is, can, can only be done as and when a safe vaccine approved for use in children. Until such time, what we should do is to make sure that all the workforce in the school, including those who are not teaching, office staff and transport staff, everybody in school dealing with children is vaccinated so that there is a protective mantle around the children. Similarly, every person eligible for vaccine in a household with children should be vaccinated so that the children are protected. We also need to protect the entire workforce in India, the organized, unorganized, self-employed, everybody. The workforce has to be immunized. If we do that, then we can get the economy back on its feet. Now, now that the numbers have come down, the migrant laborers who had moved from metros back to their original villages will start moving from villages back to metros. But before they do that, we need to make sure that they are vaccinated. Now, I said the antibody levels vary, and therefore, people may have reinfection. So, a booster dose of vaccine is probably required for those who have waned immunity, whose immunity has come down. This will include the elderly, particularly men, and those who are vulnerable due to comorbid conditions, like patients who have or, or cancer chemotherapy, patients who are on immunosuppressants, all those people actually will require a booster dose. In the long run, once a safe vaccine for children is available, we may have to add COVID vaccine to the universal immunization program for children. This is quite on the card because the disease is endemic, it's not going away, and eradication of the virus is unlikely to be possible. At the same time, we need to reopen very cautiously schools and education institutions. The process has already started in several states in India. Businesses and industries have to open up for economic revival. But all this should be done while we continue to promote and practice concepts of social vaccine, because that is very, very important. Appropriate mask use, avoid crowding, opening elderly and vulnerable, hand hygiene, cough and sneeze etiquette. And the same way as we handle the patients who were in the vicinity of our hospital, who depended upon us for their care. The whole, same process has to be done across the nation for us to make sure that we get a handle over this epidemic in its endemic state. What are the lessons that we learned? Okay, this is a title of my lecture. In a pandemic, never underestimate the virus. We underestimated the virus, which is why we landed up with a huge second wave. The pandemic response should be based on scientific evidence. Political considerations should not cloud judgment in pandemic management. We need a strong public health department to inform the polity, professionals, and the public. Everybody needs information so that they can act appropriately. And in this endeavor, I think non-governmental organizations should work along with the government to maximize cover. We are a non-governmental organization in our hospital. And very, we work very closely with the local district administration. Intelligent use of information technology can be very effective in pandemic management. This is something that we realized quite early on in our hospital, and we were able to put it to use. We could have done better in terms of vaccination cover, but now vaccination cover is picking up pace in India. So I think we are doing reasonably well now. Effective use of social vaccine concept is fundamental and it's very useful. And while the pandemic is managed, 
we cannot ignore common non communicable diseases in the community they require attention and the strategy should include protecting livelihood and economic well being as well so we cannot allow the economy to slide down so whatever we do the strategy should include protecting livelihood and economic well being of family in a populous country like ours with considerable heterogeneity very large rural population different states and different levels of healthcare available in different states decentralized district level approach is mandatory absolutely vital you cannot have one central agency which takes care of the whole country not possible so decentralized district level approach is mandatory and for this district level information has to be available on a daily basis which is where i think we were able to make a contribution india has entered the endemic state after the second wave and the third wave seems highly improbable and the vaccination strategy has to have an appropriate course correction now so that we get the best out of available vaccine well i lot or I'll, i'll end on a slightly lighter note a universal face mask was a unique indian contribution during the covid pandemic in fact the first person to actually recommend universal face mask was professor jacob jord an eminent virologist with whom i work very closely he wrote in the newspaper saying look face mask cannot be only in hospitals or in workplaces everybody should use a face mask he said that right in the beginning now historically jain saints from the 5th century before the christian era actually wore face masks but they wore it for a different reason they wore it in pursuit of non violence they didn't want to harm any microbes that they may accidentally inhale but in the process they protected themselves also from harmful microbes in pandemic time the simple and effective protective treatments achieved preeminence <coughs> the simple face mask i feel may have benefits well beyond the pandemic it may have benefits beyond the pandemic by actually reducing exposure to environmental allergens nasal allergy wheeze may become less exposure to particulate air pollution which is common in our metros exposure to noxious fumes to a certain extent at work spots and exposure of healthcare professionals to droplet and airborne infection so the face mask i think is here to say what the jain muni started 5th century bce i think is going to be a common part of human apparel from now onwards thank you very much for the patient listening thank you very much we've been listening to professor seshadri speaking to us on lessons learned in india and a huge amount of analysis information and good advice there thank you very much for your lecture professor you mentioned first of all that lockdown had had a big effect a big adverse effect on the management of of uh, non communicable diseases like cardiovascular disease and chronic obstructive airways disease uh you didn't talk about children and dr mark reed is asking how do you think lockdown impacted child mortality from us uh, you know the health system being swamped with uh covid cases and people with with uh, childhood diseases not being able to access medical care are, are there any statistics on that i can only talk about what information i have in our own community okay and i i don't have nationwide information it's not available okay in our own community the major problem for children were two one is they were not able to go to school so the emotional well being of children was considerably affected the second was we have a very effective known meal program in schools 
So children get one meal at school every day. And for a lot of children who are actually below the poverty line, this is a very important source of nourishment. So this did suffer. All right. We tried to ensure that the children in the community that we serve had access to nutrition to the extent that we could. But it is not as good as a program where every child gets a meal at school at lunchtime. So, and education, right? Now, education had to go online. And obviously, a large proportion of children in India do not have access to online education. It really depends upon whether the parents are technologically savvy. It depends upon whether they have the equipment. It depends upon whether the school and the teachers are prepared to deliver the kind of instruction online and whether they are capable of doing that. I can tell you that suffered quite a lot. Thank you very much. So overall, in terms of the interventions, how would you compare lockdown versus social vaccine and the mitigatory measures you described there um, <clears throat> versus vaccination? W which, which of the three was most responsible for the control of the pandemic in, in India, do you think? Uh, uh, let me take the last one first, which is uh, biological vaccine. As I told you very clearly, biological vaccine started getting used in India only from the 16th of January 2021. Okay, and by the time the second wave was over, only 5.6% of the population had received adequate vaccination. Yeah. Therefore, it is easy to understand that the vaccination process with biological vaccine played only a very minor role in control of COVID in India. Now, the question about lockdown is tricky because sometimes when you are confronted with a pandemic with a new virus, which can be lethal, you do not have many options. And the process of social vaccine and you know educating the public requires a lot of time. It is not easy. And in a country like India, with a very diverse population living, and uh, it's, it's actually a huge challenge to promote social vaccine in India. We were lucky because we already had the infrastructure in our hospital to promote it. But not all institutions have access to such a network. So that is the point that I was trying to make. We need a very good public health department. We need a model like our hospital in every district so that the entire population is covered and when you want to pass on information and educate the public and effectively communicate you already have an established network we sorely felt the need for this at the national level i think a lot of people would have been uh, surprised by the levels of zero positivity in india so you quoted 67 percent zero positive after the fourth uh, uh, survey, zero survey, but of health professionals, 85 to 90%. That's in incredibly high. I would think much higher than most other countries around the world. And is it, is it that degree of zero positivity that is the main basis of your confidence about a third wave being unlikely? Precisely. Precisely. See, yeah. the Delta virus had its run in India almost unchecked. And it permeated through the entire country. And the immunity in India currently is mostly because of natural infection yeah. and very little attributable to biological vaccine. And there are studies to show that immunity conferred by infection lasts longer and is more robust than immunity due to biological vaccine, which is why it gives me a certain level of confidence to say that a third wave is improbable. It is not just vaccine-induced immunity. 
And that, that was going to be my next question, which, which is interesting. That's fascinating. So what would your comment be about the, the you know, there's a big debate <clears throat> about uh, lockdown versus herd immunity. Um, do you, it, it seems that India has reached a stage of confidence largely through natural infection rather than biological uh, vaccination. Um, do you think that has implications for other countries as well, or is the situation in India uh, unique because of the demographics of the population um, and far fewer young people as a percentage? The lesson we learned from the second wave was that India epidemic is not a single epidemic, but an epidemic in each district. And you needed a district level approach to epidemic management. Yeah. And we emphasize this over and over again. And this had an impact in the way our state actually managed the epidemic. The so decentralized, it was managed at the district level, and the district administration was responsible. And the lockdown was dependent upon more on district level lockdowns. You get what I mean? Curves would be imposed where there are more number of cases. And curves would be relaxed when the number of cases actually dipped down. So that kind of uh, management at the district level, I think, was something that we learned. And I fully agree with you. India's mortality, at least the reported mortality, is lower than what is reported in other countries. And this is largely owing to the demographics of India yeah. because we have a young population. But having said that, we do have a lot of diabetes in young individuals in India as well. Yeah. So we need to factor that in when we talk about the mortality in India. We did so, have a number of young people dying in India too, but the number was not huge. A question just on the reliability of the zero prevalence surveys and uh, Professor Nathan Grills is asking, how confident can we be about those zero prevalence surveys? Were they representative of sufficient size? Uh, was the risk of cross reactions ruled out? Do you, do you think those are reliable numbers? The, the method you adopted was, uh, uh, you know, cluster sampling from uh, every district. And uh, it actually, the method deployed statistically was pretty robust. The method deployed was statistically quite robust. But the number of people who were included in the zero prevalence study for a large population like this was relatively small. But I think for the first zero prevalence study, they gave the confidence intervals. Okay. So, yeah. The confidence intervals were wide in the first zero prevalence study. I need to point that out okay. because of the smaller number of people who were subjected to it. And uh, I'm just conscious we're running out of time. Let me just ask you one more question. It was fascinating to hear the report in your own locality about how you were able to change the management of uh, particularly non-communicable diseases, to uh, work more through mobile clinics, uh, making measuring devices available to families and communities and so on. Do you think that the COVID pandemic is going to bring about some positive change in the management of, of uh, non-communicable diseases in the community that might not have happened otherwise? And, and how significant is that? going forward? I, I think you hit that nail on the head. I think the COVID pandemic has actually taught us that non-communicable diseases can be effectively managed at home, provided you have a good network and provided devices are made available to the person affected. Okay, so this would reduce the amount of time spent by people in hospitals and they won't be exposed to other pathogens when they visit hospitals. And it'll reduce the amount of 
uh, money they will lose by uh, not going to work. So I think it is going to have a major impact on the way we manage non-communicable disease. Provided everybody accepts it. See, there is a, you know, there are a lot of patients who still want to see their physician. Okay. They can see the physician on a, I can see you. Same way a patient can see me with available IT. But that is not enough. They want to see their physicians in person. That's a mindset. And we need to work on it. It requires considerable amount of work. Lovely. Well, and you've emphasized all the way through the importance of the change in mindset and the importance of education and how that made such an impact, particularly at the district level, in terms of modifying people's behavior in a, in a positive way to mitigate the effects of the pandemic. So thank you so much. It, we, we may be left with a lot more questions at the end, but we really have run out of time. And uh, so it just remains for me to say thank you so much, Professor, for your time, uh, your wisdom and experience, and your simulating talk. Uh, God bless you all, and we hope to see you then. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and I thoroughly enjoyed interacting with you. Thank you. Thank you.